this is the civil discourse panel number eight, I think, and I'm here with Vern Hinman. Thank you, Vern, for coming on and talking to us. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So my first question, we're going to be talking about mostly religion today. My first question would be, what do you think is like the biggest turnoff for people from Christianity? Like, is there, if there's like one what? specific thing that's the biggest. Just one? Just one? The biggest few, maybe. Oh, yeah. Um, so, Chris. Christianity and following Jesus don't aren't necessarily a one-to-one -one comparison. I think uh, uh, Gandhi said, the famous Gandhi saying, you know, I, I really love Jesus. It's the Christians that drive me crazy uh, to sum it, what he said. Um, I think if you, if you look at where we go really wrong, uh, the crusades really wrong. We have Jesus who says, love your enemies. Do good to those who persecute you. If a soldier makes you carry his stuff for a mile, carry it for two. Just be humble and be loving. That's his whole gig. It doesn't change. His whole ministry doesn't change. And somehow we ended up with uh, the Crusades being a good idea, <laughs> you know, fighting over land. Um, we ended up in these aberrations. And the aberrations, we, we just go horribly wrong when that happens. Um, so there's a couple of things um, what I believe is um, we, we become spiritually alive and following Jesus is the, the, the most human way to live. And if you see it that way, you can, you, you got a really good thing going. But I think um, if you look at the cathedrals in Europe, um, they were built on indulgences. They were built um, by telling people, hey, you know, your Aunt Mary, who you love very much, um, is in purgatory in horrific pain and for about five grand I think I can get her out <laughs> you know and uh, you know and we had the reformation because of stuff like that it's abusive but then we do the same thing we have another version of that which says um, we have a Dante's version of hell not not what what scripture teaches and uh, so uh, we sell Jesus. First of all, we sell Jesus. That's a bad idea. We sell Jesus the way we sell vacuum cleaners. The way you sell vacuum cleaners, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this, the really high-end ones, uh, the ones you buy for like a couple of grand. I don't know why. I'm, I'm saying this theoretically. I didn't ever get sucked into this. I'm just telling you that right now. But uh, they come into your living room and they say, okay, if, if you let them in, they, say, they, they have you vacuum with your vacuum cleaner the carpet. And then they pull their brand new vacuum cleaner out and a brand new bag and they revacuum what you just vacuumed and they cut the bag open and they show you what your vacuum cleaner missed and it is ugly it is nasty what they don't tell you is if they put another new bag in theirs and did it again it would be just about as ugly <laughs> but um they knock on your door introduce you to a problem you don't know you have and try and sell you a solution for it and that's what we do to jesus we we bang on people's door we say, Jesus loves you, but his dad hates you. <laughs> uh, he's furiously smearing you with his blood so, no, so his dad doesn't kill you. And um, if you just do these things, you can avoid him torturing you forever. How about that? And um, most sane people look at that deal and they're like, wasn't really looking for a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> 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 and could you leave? You know, yeah. uh, so we use abusive tactics. We use, use tactics to try and introduce people to this life that is a beautiful life. It's unnecessary. Um, it builds things other. So currently we're not building a ton of cathedrals. We're building followings. We're building millionaire pastors. We're building things um, that we ought not be building. And when we do that, it takes away from this life that is beautiful. Um, Christianity, the, the closest religion to Christianity that I know of is uh, pure Buddhism. And Buddhism is, is this idea of living more fully um, by, by, by reducing, you know, by reducing stimuli and, and some other means. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful religion. And um, Christianity is about living more fully, but filling ourselves with the spirit of God. 
and doing it not in our power, but uh, by but a power outside of ourselves. One of the most beautiful ways of seeing that occur is um, in recovery. I used to run um, classes in Cumberland County Prison uh, for people that were hooked on crack, meth, heroin, coke, sex, drugs, uh, uh, alcohol, pick a number. And, and you learn that effort, uh, trying to, trying to uh, resolve those addictions by the effort of a, of a human's internal effort is futile. Um, where fe people find sobriety and where they find freedom is when they surrender to about a power greater than themselves. It's mm -hmm. like a miracle. It is a miracle, I think. And um, everything I know, I'm a fourth generation pastor, um, but everything I know about Jesus came from learning uh, what people know in prison in recovery. It, it is a beautiful thing. And uh, it changed my life. I, I wasn't expecting it. I was expecting to go help other people. I did not. I had great ideas about how I was going to help them. <laughs> yeah. And, and I learned, oh, it doesn't work that way. And um, it's not my, my work is valuable in some ways, but only to the extent that I point to Jesus, only that I, exp I point to uh, love. So the way I think Christianity actually works, um, uh, dark is not an entity, it's the absence of light. And, and uh, heat is not, uh, uh, cold is not an entity, it's the absence of heat. And dark, uh, uh, um, fear is not an entity, it's the absence of love. And so I think when we are, when, when we're um, relationally connecting to Jesus, uh, the idea is that like, if, if I have a coffee cup and, and I've got air and I wanna get the air out, I can suck a vacuum on it, but the air will leak back in. The idea of getting the air out of a coffee cup is you fill it with coffee and, and the air is displaced and it won't come back. And that's the idea of, of us as human beings to be, to live most fully human, to live fearlessly is to have the fear displaced out of our life by love. And when we're doing that, very few people are adverse to being loved. And when I say loved, I mean cared for in meaningful ways. And so some people are because they've been cared for in meaningful ways as, as a point of, of manipulating them, right? Somebody like, I'll care for you. And oh, by the way, there's a hook in this. And I think as Christians, we really screw up when we when we feed people, but we have a hook in the food, <laughs> you know, that happens one time and uh, they don't take food from you anymore <laughs> as, as they shouldn't. Yeah. So it's a one, the first reason would be a false package or a bad package, like sold in the wrong way. And then it would be just like a lack of what it's really about. Like they're just, they're selling the wrong version. They're selling something that isn't, they're selling a, um, I forget who exactly said this, but he said, uh, God created man in his own image and man returned the favor. Oh, yeah. I've heard uh, that. I heard that recently. That might have been yeah. C.S. Lewis. In, I forget. I, sure. I, I think it's an obscure guy that actually said it and a bunch of people yeah. repeated it. Uh, I, I looked it up recently. and But anyhow, long, long story short, the God who is Jesus, um, the, you know, the love of the Father in the power of the Spirit, in the way of Jesus, the Trinity that we talk about, the oneness of the Trinity, um, it doesn't need soul. <laughs> it doesn't, you know, think about it. Um, you, you have a, a young father who's holding his firstborn child. What selling do you need to do to that, to that father to, to love that child? You just don't have to, there ain't no selling. You know, it's, 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 it, it just is. Where did the love come from? I don't know. It just is, you know, I was, I was not a father and then my wife delivered a baby and then I was a father and everything changed. And, um, I am, you know, thank God for my kids. I would still be really more selfish than I am, you know, um, having children uh, pulls you out of yourself. It causes you to realize that you're not the center of the universe. And that, and, that, and that love is great. So I have three positions to look at. For There's me and my relationship to my kids, my relationship to myself, and my relationship to God and other people. And um, so often when I'm working with somebody, um, we, we reserve the right to be mean to ourselves. 
we think that um, when we do something that is unhelpful, if we punish ourselves, it'll somehow keep us safe. And it doesn't, it just makes, it just grinds it into our soul is what it does. So um, often I, I have to pry people's hands from around their own neck, you know, because they've made mistakes and they're trying to strangle the mistake out of themselves. If you think about uh, jelly on an Angora sweater, you know, a little chunk of jelly uh, on, the, on a real hairy sweater, you can take a knife and flick it off or you can take a rag and grind it in. You know, if you grind it in, it's never coming out. But if you flick it off, it doesn't ever get really on the sweater, just a, just a couple of hairs of the sweater. And I think that's the issue when we're, when we're dealing with ourselves is to be, um, is to be kind. The, the way forward is kindness. It's not angry. It's not, you know, one of my favorite passages in the Bible, I, oh man, it just brings me to tears, is um, love is patient, love is kind, love does demand, demand its own way, 1 Corinthians 13. It's one of the most beautiful passages in any literature. And it says, um, love is patient. It, 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 um, and it's all about love. It's about, uh, and we don't manufacture love. It's really hard to love some people. You know, it's really hard to love somebody that we think is pure evil, but nobody is pure evil. Uh, and, and so the idea is we don't manufacture the love. We don't manufacture love. We don't forget manufacture forgiveness. We don't manufacture, um, grace none of that we receive it from jesus and we give it so if you cannot forgive someone they have done something and you cannot forgive them the answer is not to try harder the answer is a short prayer and it says jesus will you give me the forgiveness that i need to forgive this person because i can't do it by myself and um that's christianity that's what it's all about it's about love and forgiveness and um dealing with resentment um, and learning to be generous in a world that is not generous. The world's DNA is uh, what I call the empire. The empire is the world, the Roman empire, the American empire, all these empires. They work on fear and scarcity. Um, and so basically, if you take away scarcity, you start giving food to people and they don't work, they won't work. You know, So the empire knows don't give out food unless people are working, because if you make them comfortable, they won't work. So keep them just a bit uncomfortable. Uh, you can think about that fear and scarcity is managed misery, you know, not too, un, you know, don't let the don't let the rabble get too comfortable because they'll quit working, make sure they have a mortgage, make sure they have these things that keep them motivated to, to participate. And the kingdom of Jesus is built on love and generosity. And Love means not, 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 not the sexualized love that we see, although that's included in, in American westernized versions of love. Love is setting the other person up for success. What does your life need from my life for you to be successful? Do you find love and joy and happiness? And so that's um, usually I think about that as fertility. Like we don't try to fix other people. We become fertile ground for them to plant themselves in. And you know what fertility is, right? You know what makes fertility? <laughs> poop. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's, you know, you, you get, you know, no poop, no fertility. And um, so, so we share the brokenness of our lives. And it's in the sharing of the brokenness of our lives that other people can find growth. We don't try and fix them. We believe that between Jesus and themselves, they can, they can find a way forward. But if we're, if we're fertile for them, we got two things. We protect, we push the world back so that it does not, it doesn't drown them. And we, we create a context. We push the world back a little bit and we become fertile for their lives. So if you want to, a measure of success is not how many people you convince to say a prayer. That is not a measure of success. Jesus says, nowhere does Jesus say, go make converts. He says, make disciples. Big difference. A measure of success is how many people's lives are doing well because of your life. Because you accepted the generosity of Jesus and you provide the generosity of Jesus to the people around you. So a great measure of success is how is the love of Jesus seeping into the lives around you because you exist. And if that's what you're about, there's very few people shut you down. Yeah. But 
you know, you don't have to go to the, you, you know, you don't become militant over that. You don't get across a picket line and say, you know, you're taking the Ten Commandments off the courthouse and damn you, you know, <laughs> which is actually one of the Ten Commandments you shouldn't break. But, but, uh, but, but here's the thing: um, Ten Commandments is Old Testament. It's it is in the progression of what God is doing amongst humans. Um, it was it was uh, Old Testament. Jesus re-ups that in the the Sermon on the Mount. He goes, "You've heard it said." And he talks about the Ten Commandments. You've heard it said, don't kill somebody. Uh, if you think badly about somebody, you're killing them. You're guilty of the same thing. So Jesus takes the Ten Commandments and ups the bar. So for Christians who get all twisted out of shape because the Ten Commandments aren't in the courthouse, I'm like, great. Could we could we replace them with the, um, with the Sermon on the Mount? Uh, because, because that's not going to be good for you. <laughs> You know, the Sermon on the Mount is not about them fixing themselves. It's about you having a, having the transfigured heart, transfigured to the love of Jesus. Jesus, um, Jesus broke down barriers. The Romans were occupying, in a very horrific way, occupying Israel. And, and uh, Jesus healed the centurion's servant and, and then said, to the, to the centurion who's an occupying force is you kind of get this and and my buddies here who are jewish they, they're not getting it <laughs> you get it better than they do it's kind of embarrassing you know it's like going to uh it's like uh for us it would be like running into a, a, a hamas general and one of our religious leaders saying oh you you hamas guys get it these guys don't get it quite yet <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, it's what got him crucified eventually you know he yeah. kept saying stuff like that <laughs> <laughs> yeah say stuff if we're, long enough somebody's going to be mad it's, it's, it's going to be the people who are who, who think you should be shilling for them yeah and and i think that you know recently i've seen a bunch of christian leaders making horrific horrific mistakes in in um in trying to for you're trying to build laws that force other people to do what they think they should do instead of you know alcoholics and has this great saying attraction not promotion don't promote a better life attract people to a better life they'll come and we we we, we have to respect that people can make their own mind up and um i think I think for a lot of people, I had a guy, I had a guy talking to me. He's, he didn't, I don't tell people I'm a pastor necessarily. And I don't necessarily look like a pastor at the beginning and I don't talk like one either. So, you know, and uh, so I had this guy, I was seeing this guy working on, you know, working on his problem, an interventionist and working on his problems. And at some point or another, he realizes I'm a pastor. I tell him I'm a pastor. He goes, oh, you're going to tell me to go back to church, aren't you? And I said, no. No, I'm going to beg you on my knees, beg you not to go back to church. Because when you went to church last time, you found a Jesus that was not anything like the real one. And I don't want you finding that guy again. I want to introduce you to the real Jesus, the Jesus I know, the Jesus that moved the church out of the building into the hearts of men and women and said, you are the church. Go be the church and go love like I love. And so please meet that guy and then go back to church, but take him with you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how, can, how can someone who's met the wrong Jesus, like say their church was built on the premise that God is love, but also wrath. And they were living under like a fear-based religion. How could they, if they're like born into that, or maybe they've been in that for a long time, how do they, how do they find like the real Jesus out of that? Well, a very common way, there's a couple of ways we call deconstruction. Um, deconstruction is basically, and, and, and amongst the fundy realm, the deconstruction is a swear word. Um, but deconstruction is basically, I think deconstruction is iterative. I don't see it's a bad thing. It's, it, 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 uh, deconstruction is saying, um, okay, I've learned all these things. Some of, some of what I've learned is applicable and good. And some of it is just wrong. What's what? So it's like uh, tearing the house down, picking the boards that are good and building the house again. And um, 
So there's, um, I'll, I'll give an example. Often people talk about by being biblical Christians. And I know what they mean by that, but, but I, I use the Bible differently than I used to. I don't look at the Bible as a history book or as a science book or as a uh, often sometimes an instruction book, but rarely. I look at the Bible as a window through which I can see Jesus and I can accurately see Jesus. And I, I try not to get too revved up about the glass in the window. I keep, keep looking at the glass. I want to look through the glass to the life of Jesus, to the life of the apostles. What did it mean? And not only what did it mean, what did they mean, what was happening, but what was happening in culture that they did that? Because if you read the Bible flat, you can come up with some cockamamie thing. So um, I use scripture differently. And, you know, when you read the parable, there's a, in the Bible, there's a parable about um, the talents. It's, you know, this, uh, this um, master has these, this, this sums of money that he gives to his servants and he goes away and he comes back and, and he rewards uh, the servants based on what they got. And, and, and the one guy that got the least amount, he buried it. And he basically says, I buried it because you're a jackass. <laughs> you know, you, got, you get buried it because you're a jerk. And everybody knows it. And he gets punished, you know, for, for but he's just not punished because he didn't make any money. He's punished because he had a really bad attitude. Um, but when I was younger, I thought that was about investment advice. And, and to an extent it is. But there's this deeper thing which is, oh, God has entrusted us with attributes, with talents and skills. You have this wonderful skill of, of in interviewing people and bringing things out of them and, and, and providing that to the world, and you're using it. So you're investing your talent in the kingdom of God right now. It's beautiful. And that's what, that's what Jesus expects of us, that we, not because we have to, but because we can. You didn't do this because, oh, geez, I got to do another freaking interview because Jesus will be pissed if I don't. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's not like that. You're like, oh, oh, I got a bunch of things to do today. But when I get all those things done, I'm going to do this thing that makes my heart come alive. And, and that's when you're most fully human is when then that's happening. I look at our internal workings as I use this thing, spires is a spiritual, physical, intellectual, relational, and emotional. And often where we go wrong is we make Christianity an intellectual thing. You sit in a, in a, in a building and you listen to a lecture and, and that's it. That's what Christianity means. And I'm like, Oh yeah, no, that uh, that's actually one, one fifth of who you are that you're bringing. Uh, Christians sing at their services. And I believe the reason we do that is to wake up the emotional side of us so we get the emotional and the intellectual side actually present. But then there's the physical side, you know, you sing and you listen to the sermon, you know, half the people are nodding off. Well, you know, the, the physical side's gone, you know, physical side's gone, you're gone, you know? And so I look at what's it take to keep all of those things alive at all times and growing. There's a movie, uh, M. Night Shyamalan had this movie called um, The Woman in the Water, I believe, or something. And he had in there's a character in the in the movie that has one arm buff, like completely buff, and the other's flaccid. He never works out that side. He's just really asymmetrical. And, and that's what we do as Christians. We we use this intellectual side, we intellectualize faith, or we spiritualize it, which is even worse. And we don't make it physical. We don't make it, and so we end up with really buff physical and intellectual, uh, spiritual and intellectual, but flaccid physical. You know, somebody comes to us and say they're hungry, and we say, oh, we'll pray for you. Well, it's a wonderful thing to do, but you should feed them first. <laughs> you know, like, you answer the need based on the, the realm that it's in. If they say they're hungry, that's a physical realm. Feed them. And then if you want to talk about things, go, go talk about things if they're open to it. But feed them. <laughs> you know, uh, meet the need as it's, you know, if, if that's what you believe you should do, meet the need. And then... Um, but don't spiritualize what is not spiritual. Uh, the other thing I ha I think um, we uh, Christians believe in the supernatural. We believe that uh, God is God has supernatural powers. But but God also created the natural order of things, and uh, He works most often in the natural order of things. If if you're working with somebody and they walk off the edge of a roof, we look down. <laughs> 
because we know gravity works that way <laughs> and we don't look up because it's probably not he's probably not going up you know he goes he goes yeah. down is really reliable gravity's reliable it's uh it's not just the good idea it's the law <laughs> you know and uh so we 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 know the predictability of science is what god has created and i think we can um treat god as magical i don't think god's magical he's supernatural but not magical and uh, so, for instance, magical, you say the right incantation and the right and, and this thing happens that's supernatural. We don't have to do the right incantation, incantation to get God to work. He's already working. Uh, he, is, he is working in us and through us and with us. And it's he's not looking us for us to dial the right combination. Uh, you two um, had a great tune about this. Oh, it's a beautiful tune. Um, it's called surrender, which is why I like it so much. The moment of surrender. And in the, he's got this lyric. He goes, I'm punching in the numbers in the ATM machine. He's treating God like an ATM. He's punching in the numbers of the ATM. What number do I have to get to get what I'm looking for, to get the money out of this machine? And in the ATM machine, they have a reflector there so you can see if somebody's behind you. And he goes, and I caught a glimpse of my reflection in the ATM machine. And he realized, oh, the idea of our reflection is, we, God says that we are built in the image of God, and he looked at his reflection, and he saw the image of God. And when you see the image of God in yourself, you realize you don't have to punch the right, you know, you don't have to punch the right combination to get it to work. It doesn't work that way. You know, uh, with, with your own dad, you, you have a wonderful father. He's a friend of mine. And what do you have to do to get him to care for you? Nothing. 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 In fact, if you're in trouble... He's going to be closer to you. Mm. You don't have to call him when you're in trouble. He's coming if he knows you're in trouble. And because he's done that so often with you, he's the first one you call. You're like, dad, I'm in trouble. Can you come? And he's coming. He's not going to, he's not worried. He's not punishing. He's just, what do you need? Where, what hurts? What's wrong? What do you need? What can we do? Let's form a plan. And Jesus is no different in that than your father, except more so. So when we have a trust relationship with Jesus, we realize who he truly is and that he's not only coming for us for other people as well. Um, we, you know, the, the idea is that he loves us, but he loves the guy next to us. It's really, he loves the guy in the subway that's making us afraid as much as he loves you. And um, when you start to see it that way, uh, you realize that you, you receive it and you give it and you can't run out. I have a picture that I photoshopped for myself because I run out. I, I, I find myself worshiping a Jesus that is smaller than the real Jesus often. And um, I find myself believing that I have to punch in the right combination sometimes. And so I, I have a, a picture that I photoshopped to remind myself. I found a picture looking down the face of the Hoover Dam. It's a huge, you know, hundreds of feet, huge dam. And it's looking straight down. And I photoshopped a garden hose with water coming out of it about halfway down. And I think of myself as that garden hose. Like, if I was that garden hose, I would not have to worry about water conservation. I'm connected to this inexhaustible dam. And, um, and that helps me remember that I'm connected to a source that cannot be depleted. Mm -hmm. And the more you love, the more love comes to you, the more, more it happens. Most people can't. Most people experience grace for the first time when it comes through them for someone else and are shocked by it. Grace is shocking. Grace will cause you to weep. It will just, you, you, you'll be fine, everything's good. And then this act of grace will happen and you'll find yourself weeping. It's why we weep at movies hmm. often is we see a moment of grace that we can, we can connect to and it just blows us away. Is that the first question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it, it, it relates to the second one I want to ask. A little out of order, but you said um, you were talking about how, like, God is supernatural, but he created the natural world. And I don't know, like, this is this would be my first question. Why is there such a big disconnect be between science and religion? Like, it, they, well, they, want to be, they want to be pitted against each other, it seems. Well, it's a power struggle. Um, 
uh, who's going to be the who, who's going to be the chief priest? Um, some great song, Rush. The the band Rush has some great songs about. Uh, they, they have a, 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 a and their album Twenty One Twelve. They have, have a, a, I, I grew up Canadian, so um, you know I'm going to talk about Rush at least once. Uh, they have a, on Twenty One Twelve. They have the, the the Temples of Syrinx, and uh, we are the priests of the Temple of Syrinx. This, this is a power play. So when you see people that are in a power play, they're going to and, and they've an intellectualized faith. It, Faith is intellectual, but faith, that's one one fifth of what it is. And if, but if they've made it into a proposition, and they've literalized the Bible, you know, they talk about the Bible is a very literal thing. I can ask some simple questions on that one. Like you think about Noah's Ark, all the animals had to get on. Well, the kangaroo. So this happened in the Middle East, right? I've been to actually. I was in Turkey. I've been to where Mar Mount Ararat is. I've seen Mount Ararat. I know where it is, which is where we believe the Ark ended up. Somehow the kangaroos and the platypuses got from <laughs> Australia in a very short period of time mm -hmm. to get on the ark. How'd that happen? Uh, yeah. And if they could get from Australia in that short amount of time, why'd they need the ark in the first place? They, they must've been flying. They should have just yeah. stayed in the air for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like the story, in a literal sense, the stories break down a bit. And then we talk about Gilgamesh and, and the fact that thousands of years before the recorded version of Noah, there was a similar uh, plagiarized story from a previous, from a previous um, epic. And if you see it, if, if you need it to be flat, if you need it to be flat, if you need it to be a hundred percent, I, I, so I don't think that um, myths are untrue. I just don't think they're literal. You know, I don't, I think there's some, there's some literal parts that there's some things that are literal. So I'm not exactly sure how to make the Noah story work perfectly. I, I don't need to. Um, I, I, it's in there. It has some important information and, um, and I try to be aware of the information. It has some, um, it has some symbolic information about what happens later as well. So it is loaded with information, but if you need that to be true, then you're going to get sideways with a science person who's drilling ice cores and can actually prove the the, the time period of what's happening. And and you're you're what they call a young Earth creation. You're six thousand. You believe the world world happened in six thousand years, and they're looking at things saying, you know, I'm, I I I don't know for sure how long it is, but I know you're wrong. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um. So, so we have, um, so a beautiful thing about science is science is answering the, the um, it's looking at how things happened, um, but it's not necessarily saying why, you know, it's the realm of why Theolo theologians major in why and dabble in how, and, uh, and uh, scientists major in how and dabble in why, and and um, there, if if we're looking at the scientific record that we that we can measure and replicate, so there's a bunch of things we can replicate. There's an area of science called dendrochronology, which they look at the the growth rings in trees. Each year, a tree grows a growth ring, and how wide the growth ring. They're sequential, so that the, they got rings around a tree. When you when you cut a tree down, there's these rings, and the 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 width of any given ring correlates to how good that year was how much growth did it get based on how much sunshine it got how much water it got all those things and so the trees in a general area will all do well one year and all do badly another year based on the same weather patterns so what's really interesting about dendrochronology is we can pick trees from that we that we are, are able to put in time and then we look at the core we look at the um the sequence of growth rings and we can we can actually find that sequence in other trees so i'll give you an example of that happening um there's databases that stuff now so uh there's a um some friends of mine were rebuilding the tavern in in um locally here they're rebuilding a 200 year old tavern 
and they got underneath it and they cut they cut a, 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 a section of the logs that the place was built on and then they they had dendrochronology done on them and they could tell you specifically uh when that log was cut down they know based on the growth rings exactly when it was cut down well those things can overlap over a long period of time we can start to get time frames for things just based on the wood that we find with them that's just one you know they do ice cores they go into ancient ice um, and then we have geology you know you go to niagara falls and you look at the sides of the rock and you can see these these layers that correspond to epochs of time and that that so scientists are working themselves what that means so we have the theory of evolution and and so we have a when that first came out the origin of species we first came out, it seemed like good ideas seemed like a pretty good explanation for things and we accepted a significant amount of it and then over time we have had to modify that because you know what what they said at the time was okay there's these gaps in the fossil record and there's these there's these things that will fill in later the theory is pretty good they if, it, if it's true they'll fill in later and a lot of them did not fill in and so we have uh for instance we have we, we talk about millions of years of development for a life form to take place and then we look at the fossil record and we have this explosion of life forms occurring in a really short period of time geologically a really short period of time that it couldn't possibly have happened if it just happened by happenstance or something else had to have happened science will look at at, at natural ways of looking at that and good for them that's what they're supposed to do and religion shouldn't get too twisted <laughs> twisted you know we, we used to think that the earth was the center of the universe and we we you know crucified we we got we tortured people who didn't think that and that was a huge mistake we should not be in that business we're not in the torturing business we should give up the torturing business <laughs> yeah 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 That's we're not, not the crucifiers yeah. we should not be trying to crucify people yeah and so, but, and like, in my in my conversations with people who take the bible as like flat who, who take it for face value um they seem to think that any amount of scientific allowance when it comes to the biblical stories just just crushes everything that the biblical stories will teach like it they seem to think that it's either one or the other and that nitpicking will yeah. end up causing the denigration of the whole uh, thing it's a dualistic view and so I, the way i look at that is i believe that that uh god god created the 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 record the fossil record the sedimentary record all these records that we can look at and measure were created by god in my in my mind and we believe that scripture was inspired by god so if the fossil record and scripture disagree then we either misunderstand scripture misunderstand the fossil record or both <laughs> and my my guess is probably both mm -hmm. you know uh, science never believes you know science even when it's relatively certain doesn't hardly ever say we're absolutely certain do we say with some certainty they say as far as we can tell you know we map the human genome and we're like oh we're going to know so much when that happens we're going to be able to describe where we find what causes things and whatever and so we map the human genome and and what do we find oh there's a programming language it's even deeper than that you know and so we got epigenetics and these other areas of science that are it just the, the rabbit hole just gets getting deeper it just getting more complex and more beautiful and that's the beauty of science please don't stop that because we think of we've come up with some religious reason to stop why would you do that keep keep discovering the bible and jesus are on your side <laughs> keep looking yeah. and and discover what you can and um I do believe that uh, one thing that I think religion tends to do is to give oversimplistic answers to complex things. So I think, you know, the 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 Snopes trial, the Scopes trial, you know, the monkey trial back back before I was born, um, or around the time I was born, um, we 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 get into culture wars. That, that's the deal. It's not only science. We get into culture wars. We're not, why, why are we doing this? Like, how are we demonstrating the love of Jesus in the culture war? Standing across a picket line, yelling at somebody we disagree with. 
or throwing something at them or or invading the freaking capitol building i mean what 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 are we doing <laughs> really you know yeah. it's it, if you look at the entirety of scripture if you look at the the the, the the Bible as a lens to Jesus. If you look at the Old Testament as a lens to Jesus. Um, so it's unnecessary. It's yeah. unnecessary. Uh, and I think we put really good scientists off. There are some amazing Christian scientists. We, when we, So one thing that scientists don't generally spend a lot of time talking about is the spiritual aspects of humanity. You know, that's just not, not necessarily a realm they spend a ton of time in. Some scientists do, yes. Um, life sciences people are, are, are interested in that. Yeah, you know, you know but, I, um, funny thing. Let me take like, a top down. Here's how it is. Take it or leave it. Uh, take you or leave you because you took it or left it. You know, <laughs> where it's 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 a travesty. It's not it's not what Jesus was about. Attraction, yeah. not promotion. And I think the, the spirit. Um, when we're doing aspect, that, we become attractive yeah. people. Yeah. And and oh, by the way, what I believe based on scripture. When I was a child versus as a young adult versus what I do now, I'm about finished a doctorate at a DMIN uh, in semiotics. What I believe now is really different, you know, so you could say I am becoming less error prone, <laughs> you know, but, you know, as an engineer, I, my, my first career as an engineer and, and what you learn as an engineer, the more you know, the more you learn, the less you know. We used to say as engineers, the more I learn, the less I know. Before long, I'm going to know everything about nothing. <laughs> yeah. But you 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 learn your ignorance, right? You yeah. as you learn, you become aware of how truly ignorant we are. You know, you just yeah. the more you learn. And I think um, for for some people when they're reading the scripture, they become more certain. And faith and certainty aren't necessarily friends. Um, yeah. and, and they can cause us to be real jackwads, you know, we can, yeah, I think the science just, and spirituality, just, thing. Like, oh, no, no, could we not do that? <laughs> uh, could we think of a different way? I was just going to say the science and spirituality thing. I think the interesting thing recently, there's been kind of a, kind of a more, more acceptance for psychedelics. Because a lot, oh, of, yeah. a lot of scientists are psilocybin, really, yes, yeah, like psilocybin, ayahuasca, DMT, all these things are being actually used in clinical trials in clinical settings that are actually helping people. And it seems like there's more, like among the scientific community, there's more of an acceptance of these things because they're realizing that, like, perhaps the spiritual aspect is more healing than they first realized. So well, it's, it's their way in, right? It's, yeah. it's the way they're going to become really aware of that and good for it. It's, I, I recently watched um, a documentary on the, there's a, I forget his name now, but there's a guy at West who is the, the guru of these plants. And uh, mushrooms, they're, they're, they're generally all forms of, of mushrooms. And um, he said the biggest, the biggest living organism on, um, on earth is a mushroom. It's the size of a, a mountain. It's because they they communicate. They start to, they connect to each other. It becomes one big organism, which I didn't know before. Uh, and they have communication systems. Plants have communication systems where they um, can uh, warn of predators and mm -hmm. and give them. You know, it's really they're, they're way more complicated than we ever thought. Uh, so yeah, uh, and and how does that affect the human brain? Like we we. Um, Psychedelics got a really bad, what, what happened, we had some psychedelics before World War II, and then they got wrapped around, um, or after World War II, they got wrapped around the, the, the 60s counterculture movement. Yeah, and like the Manson family. And yeah, it just, and it, and it got to be, so the idea of these, uh, of these drugs, from a historic standpoint, these are not new things. They have been used yeah. in in religious ceremony for thousands of years, and you know, it wasn't in these cultures. It wasn't it wasn't the kids getting a bunch of shrooms and running out to the river and getting high. That's not what happened. That yeah. just was unthinkable in those cultures. It was um, it was to uh, to create a context for for spiritual awareness, and um, people are finding. Um, 
when they're worked with, with, in a clinical setting, uh, people are finding extended relief from um, depression, anxiety. Yeah. And, and so as a tool, it's a wonderful tool. They got a bad rap because they were, you know, at some point we declared a war on drugs and, and really that's a whole new topic. You know, the war on drugs that we declare this, first of all, it's asinine. And secondly, it's racist. So um, we, you know, the, the reality is you think about what we did relative to drugs, we decided that we were going to interdict the supply and do virtually nothing about the demand. And when you yeah. do that, you raise the price. That's all you do. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we've actually created narco syndicate money greater than countries south of us. You know, we have destroyed entire civilizations south of us because, because of the it's sheer volume of the cash that goes into our addictive yeah. reality. I want to, I want to move on, but I have something to say about that. I found really interesting the other day I heard it was down, it was, it was in South America, some country, um, they legalized heroin, but only, or it might've been, I think it was heroin but only under supervised use. And they saw that the, like the rate that people were dying using it just dropped. Like oh, oh yeah. From it. Canada has that. They call, Canada has sh shooting galleries. They call it their government sponsored shooting galleries. And I have a friend who is uh, one of the primary advocates of Canada for that. Um, if you look at, if you look at it as disease, you look at it, addiction as disease process, then keeping people alive while you deal with the disease is paramount. So setting, if you look at it as bad behavior, then no, you're not going to set up a shooting gallery. <laughs> but if you look at it as a life-threatening illness, yeah, do what you got to do to keep people alive long enough that they can get help. And yeah, and actually I think Oregon recently passed, mm. decriminalized a lot of stuff. There's a difference between making legal and decriminalizing. And um, yeah, so we're starting to become aware as a culture that we, that our whole orientation, well, we're starting to realize that mass incarceration is a blot on our conscience and and also uh uh for-profit prisons and there's a ton of like you start pulling on that thread and it gets ugly really quick and it's stupid i mean beyond ugly there's ugly and stupid and you don't want both in the same being it's just not a yeah you're I not getting any dates with ugly and stupid i'll just tell you that <laughs> yeah i listened to this podcast this guy that his he studies psychedelics and he wrote a whole book about the relationship between christianity and psychedelic use and it's it's on my queue of books to read but i can send you the podcast it was super oh yeah and i'll send you the um i'll send you the program the 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 psilocybin program um this this gentleman out in oregon that uh is the guru um so very interesting and very informative i believe that um locally i believe that uh Johns Hopkins is doing mm -hmm. some clinical trials. And because I'm an interventionist, I'm really interested in, um, I have a friend who is dealing with addiction and got some, mo most of our addictions are a dysfunctional way of managing some other issue in our life. And so the idea of antidepressants or psilocybin or any of these things is, is not to permanently uh, it, it is not to, um, it's not to necessarily resolve them with that. It's to buy enough space that other therapies can work. Yeah. And is, is to buy enough life that we can get, you know, get the whole thing or oriented again and not to develop a new dependency. That makes no yeah. sense. And mo most, if I'm not sure if all psychedelics are non-addictive, but most are at least. So that's the but, other good thing about but it. But they're also dangerous. Like there's there's right. contraindications. And and um, I was listening to uh, uh, the, the gentleman that had the, the other day that um, the Canadian guy that was uh, having a, um, a reflection on Jordan Peterson. I forget the guy's oh, name. Oh, um, uh, Gabor Mate or? Yeah, 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 yeah. He, he was talking about uh, yeah, suicide. Actually, and, yeah, I was listening to something that he was talking about it too, but yeah. Ahead. And, and he was, he, he's had experience clinically with it. He's a clinical psychologist. And, and he said, yeah, you know, there are contradications. There are some people that are uh, predisposed to, to um, certain mental disorders. So you would never use that. Yeah. Because you can, you know, you can cause a, a you know, yeah, like, cause like a huge, schizophrenia. Sure. 
there's some things that you want to be careful about. And that's why clinical use, they talk about, he was talking about microdosing mm -hmm. and how that can be uh, helpful. But as Christians, we've already thrown it in the sin bucket. So we can't even, we can't even look at it. Like we're like, yeah. oh yeah, that's uh, that's what the hippies do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you yeah. know? And uh, we're not going to look at that because, um, because we have, we we have gotten um off track we've gotten we're starting to look at things in um we're starting to look at things in in this dualistic way instead of saying instead of looking at it through another lens and also the lens of jesus what what's the spirit say i don't think recreational use of drugs is life-giving I, I i don't think doing that because your life sucks is the right answer i think uh, having the things that make your life sucky resolved are the things. But also you think about someone who, um, you think about someone who's in extreme emotional or uh, a physical pain that is unrelenting. Um, I'm not going to argue too much with that person if they find something that, that relieves the pain that they can live. Uh, yeah. if, if, uh, if the medicine that we have is not working, um, what can we do? what what does work and i think that's what jesus was jesus jesus standing in front of the woman caught in adultery facing off against the people with the rocks was not was not voting for adultery he was not saying yeah as of today this adultery thing is kind of attractive he was saying yeah you're okay she's hurt herself and her husband is somebody else but your answer's worse you know <laughs> you're you know like wrong answer we could come yeah. up with a better answer than that. And I think Jesus is into better answers. What's the better answer? What is life giving for us, for a, for us as a community? And um, I think he's going to take that approach to, to to medicine. To you know, America doesn't have healthcare. We have disease management. We don't really treat anything until it's chronic and and a problem, a permanent problem. Uh, we're not really into preventative medicine because in order to be in preventative medicine, somebody has to tell us not to eat nine Big Macs and who's <laughs> yeah. going to do that? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we have to change our behavior and God helps we're not changing our behavior. That would be communism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the, the thing about addiction that you said earlier, I really like that because a lot of you find with, I'm sure you know this, that like, like criminals who are in jail for, I don't know, drugs or whatever, and they're addicted, they they end up becoming addicted to smaller, healthier things. Like maybe they become addicted to lifting weights or running or whatever. But instead of that, like instead of becoming addicted to something else and finding that that fix, so to speak, in something else, find it in Jesus and the love that he will give instead. So, and, and there's a difference. So here's the difference between addictive relationship. Addictive relationships are called codependencies. And we do not become codependent on Jesus. Jesus always respects our agency as human beings. So we, we, you know, initially when we when we start to become a Christian, we're like, Jesus, come fix my life, please. Uh, I'm done. Come make it right. And out of some grace, he sometimes does that. But but in general, what he's saying to us is, no, actually, I'm going to give you my power. You make it right. You know, we're going to. I'm going to involve you in every step because uh, becoming a Christian is not about ripping your brain out and putting mine in it's about infusing you with a spirit that changes you and changes you into a new being mm -hmm. but your old being stays there you know like yeah we're getting techno theologically and some people would argue with that but the point is the best parts of us stay this stay there you know our memories and our connections and all the, they stay at, when we become christians but we also have a new heart we see things differently and um, so as uh, from an addiction, just because we've gone a Christian doesn't mean our heroin addiction is cured immediately. Yeah. It means that we know that there's a better way and we may surrender that every single day for the rest of our lives. We may, we may never be completely free from the danger of it, but we're, we, we can be, become free from it, but we are only one day away from using again, you know? <laughs> And, and so the idea is being dependent on Jesus uh, for everything, but also having um, not only personal, but community responsibility. 
So the first thing they tell you as an addict to find recovery is you can't do this by yourself. You need to find a community of people. You need to find somebody you trust who can be a sponsor can tell you things you don't want to hear. You know, so if you, yes, surrender to Jesus, but find a group and get a sponsor. You know, these are, it's not just one thing. It's not, Jesus is not this magic bullet. He's not magical. He's supernatural difference. Yeah. Supernatural is, uh, love is supernatural. You know, you, you, you find the gene that causes love. You won't find it. It's supernatural. Yeah. yeah that's the one thing that evolution can't really explain. Is why we're well it has it has hints at it you know there, yeah. there's some benefits to a group like if you look at uh groups that are capable of herd mentality versus groups that are not the groups that are they do better right so there is a, scientifically there is some mm -hmm. you know reason that that uh people who are loving would do better than people who are not but it still doesn't but it doesn't end to end like that's that's what i'm saying it science majors in uh how but hints at why yeah. <laughs> and, and religion majors in why but hints at how yeah so i think the next thing you kind of you kind of talked about it that um it there's the sort of like jesus has to be has to be first or perhaps something else will overtake it and i think that's what happens with like religious states because like I found this Nietzsche quote the other day that was great while I was reading through it. He said, values and their changes are related to the increase in power of those positing the values. Oh, and it, yeah. He's like that, that's exactly what happens. Like he hit the nail on the head with that. So my, my question would be, what do you think, what are your thoughts on separation of church and state? Because among, among people that I've talked to that are more fundamental, they they think that church and state should be, fully inter fully integrated and that that would help the state as a whole but it, it seems like that would be one of the values that gets corrupted as power increases yeah uh that's a that's a hairy question um because the things of 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 true christianity the things that we believe are they've been they've been they've been infused into our culture and they and they are we believe that uh, we shouldn't kill each other, you know, but there are tons of people who are not Christians who also believe that, you know, some of the most moral people I know are not Christians. Uh, so morality can exist. Uh, Jesus wasn't a moral play. Jesus is moral, but he was not a moral play. He wasn't uh, coming with a more moral way. He was, he was coming with a more loving way and from love comes morality. Um, but you can't, legislate love very well you can i mean that's what uh, when you go too far in socialism that's what we're trying to do we're trying to say well you're not that loving so i'll just borrow your checkbook and write the check for you <laughs> and it does it creates resentment is what it does and then it creates somebody getting killed you know imprisoned and killed or whatever as you go further and further in order to accomplish those things the state has to be more and more violent and that happens on the right and the left and so I don't think that, I think that uh, there are Christians who are called to be politicians and that's wonderful, but they, it should not change that we're trying to top down, to create a top down structure. I don't think that, that I don't think that we, the church, when I say the church, I mean, we as the church, the humans that, that are infused with the spirit that become the church, we, uh, we are not strongest when we are coming top down, I, I do believe like, you know, we should, we should influence the laws of the land to some extent, but, um, but with care, because ultimately what we produce with the laws is the same thing the law in the old Testament produced it produced rebels. <laughs> you know, when you try, it's the same as parenting, think about it, think about governing as parenting. You know, when your kids are small, there is a fair bit of dictating you have to do. No, you can't run in the street. I'm sorry. It's not going to happen. You know, there's some things you have to say no to, but as they get older and more capable, you you become you you, you become fertile for them. You you say, well, you got it now. You know what to do. Go do the, the things you know to do. And um, so we pick these uh, separation of church and state. Like as Christians, if we need the power, 
that's our first problem right there. If we feel like we need the power to accomplish what needs done, if we need the political power, we're already off on the wrong foot. We've already got the power. So uh, Jesus handled this a little bit. Um, Jesus was uh, addressed by some people who asked a tricky question. Rome was an occupying force, and uh, they asked the question, should we pay taxes to Rome? So if he says yes, then all the Jews are going to hate him and try and kill him. And if he says no, then the Romans are going to kill him. You can't answer this question. It's a bad question to ask. So Jesus answers it in this really creative way. He says, who's got a coin, a drachma? Who's got a coin? So he gives him a coin. He goes, puts out the coin. He goes, whose head's on the coin? Caesar's. Render unto Caesar's what is Caesar's. Render unto God what is God's. Great way to answer the question, but it's even more deep than people realized because he said, whose head's on the coin? And he says, okay, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, but render unto God what is God's. And what he was saying to the Jews, and the Jews knew this, he was saying to them, you are made in the image of God. You have the image of God on you. The coin has the image of Caesar on it. You have the image of God on it. He gets you, if Caesar gets the coin, he, God gets you. God gets humans. And so our way of thinking is fine. Caesar can demand the drachma. He can, he can demand the coin. But all of it is God's, <laughs> you know. And it was, it, you know, Jesus was not, it, it, one of the reasons he was crucified by the, 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 the Jews were okay with his, his crucifixion is because they were looking for a Messiah that was a military Messiah. And Jesus came as a helpless baby. He, he, they made a categorical error. They were looking for a military commander and they got a baby instead. And yeah. he didn't know what to do with it. And then he gets killed. You know, what do you do with that? Yeah. You know, but here's the thing hanging from the cross, the moment Jesus is hanging from the cross, the center of the empire of the world, the biggest empire that had ever existed up to that point was in Rome. And within a couple of hundred years, Rome no longer existed. And the center of Christianity in Rome, the Vatican, for a thousand years, more than a thousand years. So uh, how, many, how many battles were fought to defeat Rome by Christians? Christians became Roman candles. You know what a Roman candle is? Mm -hmm. they, they impaled a Christian and lit him up on fire, and he, the burning Christians lighted the way. They, they crucified so many Christians at one point they ran out of trees. You know? Oh my gosh, I didn't so, know that. Yeah, I'd have to look. I think Josephus said that. Um, I'd have to look it up. Uh, but there, there were like, there was a ton of crucifixions. There was a ton of, um, it's a ton of stuff going on that uh, was painful and difficult. You know, being a Christian up until uh, um, for the first few hundred years was almost a death sentence. It was, it was very difficult. And I think that that you know we look at success is is the church being empowered politically where in history it's when we're oppressed that we're the most powerful uh we um and i think you know the church the church in china right now is is being persecuted but it's growing and it's really strong you know there the people don't become christians there because just because their neighbor is just because you know it's a light it, it it could it could be very difficult for you and your family. So becoming a Christian is a risk. It's not, um, it isn't a social thing to do. It's something you do with, with, with some thought. And so they're looking at, they, and they're not looking at, so people, Christians in, in China are not thinking everything's going to work out when we get political power. They're thinking things are working out. The, the, the Christianity is growing no matter how much they try and uh, suppress it. It still grows. They suppress it. It grows more. Why, why do you think that is? Because Viktor Frankl noticed the same thing, that people who are most oppressed were most free. So, like, what, why, do you, why do you think that's, that's, like, the same thing with Christianity? Like, what's, what's going on there? Well, there's, there's a, that's a complicated thing. But um, I, there's a lot of things. Like, um, there, there are a lot of... Um, obvious things happening. Uh, for, first of all, um, a person who's under oppression has low expectations. <laughs> expectations are premeditated resentments, right? And so um, 
uh, an American Christian might come to Christ and and pray fervently for a new a new car, you know, and then it doesn't happen exactly they want or it's the wrong color or something, and 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 now now they're you know Jesus failed me now, and and the same believer in China might be praying for and I'm not saying Jesus works exactly this way, but I'm saying what they're praying for is really different. What they're praying for is more guttural, is more, um, is, and, and I think that's, I think we, uh, uh, under oppression, a lot of stuff is stripped away. Our expect, expectations are stripped away. And, and it's just you and God, you know, it's just, there's less, less is more. And um, I, I've experienced that in my own life. A lot of uh, Christians experience that. They have lives that are complex and, in my case, wealthy. And, and I'm not wealthy anymore. But I'm dependent on Jesus. You know, I know before I was pretty sure where my money came from. I worked hard, you know, and I was smart. And now um, I will get unexpected money. Your dad and I had that experience. I, um, I had, I'd had a really hard time, and um, my uh, we were hit by a drunk driver, and we, nobody in the family was working for a year. And your dad gave me a job. I was teaching seventh and eighth grade math, which was a great job, and I uh, loved working with your dad. And your dad was driving me back and forth to work, and and. Um, and I couldn't pay the power bill and I owed him like $7,000 and in Pennsylvania, you can't turn the power off during the winter time, but when it comes spring, they can. So I was working on a Friday and I get this message from the power company. Hey, we can turn you off on Monday. You're first, <laughs> you know, I'm, I seven thought I don't have the money. I don't know what I'm going to do. And, uh, and so I played, I was emotionally not in a good spot and I played we're driving home with your dad and I played, I had him play U2's Moment of Surrender on repeat, just trying to hold it together because I'm like, I got a special needs kid. I get the power. There's a whole bunch of other things that happen once your power goes off that are not good and getting it back on gets even more complicated. And so I didn't know what to do. I, I, I'm i saying to God, I, I, I this is beyond me. I, I uh, am trusting you. I, I, I'm not a wealthy guy anymore because I'm doing what I believe you want me to do and I'm trusting you. And my life means something different today than it used to, but I'm screwed and I have a problem and I can't fix it. And I need, I, if you don't come through, I'm not sure what's gonna happen. And uh, my parents who live in Canada, there's a Friday on a Saturday, they got a visit from somebody who doesn't normally visit them. And they had a long visit together. And uh, at the end of the visit, um, the people said to my parents, we have this overwhelming belief that we should send $7,000 to your son in Pennsylvania. Do you think it could help us with that? I said, wow. yeah, I think I could. They, 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 they did. So they got the money to me on that day. And I was able to pay the bill before Monday morning. Wow. It's a miracle. Uh, I could not have made that happen. And... You know, Jesus says uh, uh, a few things about this. He says, you know, take care of, take care of the kingdom and, and I'll take care of the other stuff. <laughs> and and I, I don't believe Jesus is magical. I didn't have to say the right incantation to get that to happen. I just said to, to Jesus, I'm, I'm, I'm in trouble and I can't fix it. And I, I, if you don't fix it, I don't know what to do from here. And um, that's not magical. That's supernatural. I think it was a supernatural thing happened but it's not magical. And that's happened. Those kind of things have happened to me often enough that statistically, I, I you know, my mathematical brain is, is well, what's the statistical chances those things happen is possible, but not likely. Um, so I believe it's a miracle. Um, other people might believe it's just uh, a, a number of lucky happenstances. And I'd be sad to believe that. I, 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 I believe that Believing that I'm loved is a better way, <laughs> because it because it also makes me realize that the person who most irritates me is also loved in that way. And uh, and sometimes 
maybe even interceding for them. Most of the irritating people in our lives are irritating because they're in, they're in some form of trouble. Every sin is an illegitimate way to fix a legitimate need. And there are a ton of legitimate needs in the world. And most people are struggling to, to meet their needs. I think God in his provenient grace cares for people. But I think, um, I think when we, get, we feel like we have to figure it out ourselves, the world gets harder. And we, and we isolate and we put our head down and we grind through it instead of lifting our eyes up and, and opening ourselves to other people even who are, who are also, um, everybody has something to offer. We all, we all make it down to money, right? We always, because we're American, it always comes down to money, but there's a ton of stuff money doesn't fix. And, uh, you know, when I was rich, one of the things we, a saying we used to have is, um, a problem that you can fix with your checkbook is a good problem to have because <laughs> there's a ton of stuff you can't fix with your checkbook. I don't care how rich you are. Yeah, that's, I, I think one of the big, um, one of the main arguments that new atheists kind of levy against Christianity would be like, if there is a God, why is there so much suffering? And yeah, like, that's, yeah. that's a great question. Like what, what's your it's answer to that? If there, if you do have an answer to that, well, it's a complex question, and a lot of people have tried to answer that. Well, um, I, I think that um, if you believe the Christian story, um, we chose in the garden, we chose the knowledge of good and evil over relationship. That was the point. Is um, we were tempted to believe in knowledge over relationship. The relationship that was sustaining us we didn't need that knowledge um jordan peterson makes a great the very first thing i learned from jordan peterson when i first started probably 15 years ago when i first discovered him he said he took the creation story and he said you know when we chose relationship when we chose knowledge over relationship god said to eve that childbirth was going to be painful and um peterson said you know, humans are the only, really the only mammals that are born and unable to walk. So quite some time before the time we're, we're, we're born and we can walk. Yeah, yeah. So, so he goes, there, we're already at the outer edge of the head making it out of the birth canal. If we waited any longer for the kid, for children to be able to walk, they wouldn't be born alive because their head wouldn't make it out the birth canal. So Peterson says, which I think is brilliant, he says, he said, uh, when, Jesus, when, when, when God told Eve that childbirth was going to hurt, what he was saying is a natural consequence of choosing knowledge over relationship is your head, the human head's going to get bigger and it's going to have a hard time coming out. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, recently, was... I recently listened to like the first, like, cause he did a biblical series where he like did the psychological interpretation. I listened to the first like two and I think the second one was about um, Adam and Eve in the creation story. And he had great stuff to say, like he doesn't understand Brilliant. theology in the slightest, but from a psychological perspective, he has great stuff to say about. This. Oh, it was, it was brilliant. I, I was, you know, I, I sent that to John Han years ago uh, because I, I thought it was so brilliant and I started following him. And then, you know, what's happening now is less helpful to me. It's I, I, I don't think I shy away from involving Christianity and cultural wars and he's in the thick of a culture war, you know, whether he, I, I'm not sure. I don't think he declared it, but he's in it, you know, and, and I think that we do best when we avoid the culture wars. Um, doesn't mean we have to agree. Uh, you can agree to disagree and not get part, to become part of the war. And I don't think being part of the war is helpful. I think um, more people are changed by being loved than they are by being argued to death. Yeah. You know, it's like the difference between somebody providing a meal or being nibbled to death by a duck. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, when I, when I talked to John hand that I think, I think it was the podcast we recorded for this, or it might've been the one we did before. Um, but he was talking about Jordan Peterson. He said, he hoped that because he had this whole like, um, addiction thing with benzodiazepine yeah. and he hoped that after the withdrawal, he would be a better person because he got broken down. And it, it seemed like, like I haven't listened to much of him of his recent stuff after he came back from his depression and things, 
but it seems like he's just like broken from what happened to him with his addiction. It, you know, it's a, such a beautiful thing when we were broken. I am a really different human being than I used to be. I was even more arrogant before, if you can imagine that. And I, uh, you know, I think Jordan's on a journey and he's a brilliant man. And um, I think, I think his growth will be in his own emotions. He seems very angry to me. And I, uh, I think, I think um, we all get our time, right? He's doing it in a spotlight. It's really hard to do it in a spotlight. I think uh, God protects some of us from, from becoming famous so that we can make the turn easier. And I think his life is not an easy life. Yeah. I think he's right. having, I think, uh, and um, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't recommend it. You know, it seems yeah. like a very hard way to go. And I, I hope good things for him. You know, he's a brilliant man. Uh, I think where he's going, he's, he's catching up to where John Eldridge was 20 years ago. It'd be great to have them two in a room for a little bit. Um, because Eldridge did some of the same things. Um, and as men, there's something we can learn from it. But if you go too far in that direction, you end up a culture warrior. And it, 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 it does not produce life, ultimately. Uh, uh, being a soldier in a culture war does not produce life. Um, there's a, uh, I think this came from The Road Less Traveled, I think, but I read a, a, a gentleman recently, I have to look up his name. Uh, and I had a conversation, I called him up on the phone and had a conversation with him. And he talks about these three different stages of life. Um, the first one is kind of, we're kind of criminal sort of. And then the second one is um, we become rebels. And then the third stage is uh, we become legalists. And then the fourth stage, we become free. You know, we become uh, about this external freedom. And um if you read, if you look at the stages and then you look at what people do, how they manifest their lives, you see, oh, that guy's just stuck in a stage. He's, he's going to be in that war stage for a little bit. He's just duking it out. And some people never make it out of the second stage. You know, it's okay. Their calling is there and, and they do good things there. And, um, and then other people, you know, become mystical, you know. Uh, so, you know, I, there are certain, so I, I find I get sometimes allergic around Jordan Peterson's work because I, you know, it's sort of like being on a nice straight stretch of road that you know ends in a cul-de-sac. <laughs> You're like, I'm doing 80, but there's a cul-de-sac coming up here. I know what that cul-de-sac looks like. And so I get allergic sometimes and uh, it, it can seem fairly negative. I don't mean to be negative, but, uh, but um, his, so when you talk about spire, you know, uh, spiritual, physical, intellectual, relational, and emotional. Uh, his, uh, his intellectual is gargantuan. His relational is, I'm not sure. He broke relationship with everybody he ever knew for a while. They all, all of his colleagues, you know, kind of couldn't deal with him anymore. And now he has a bunch of followers, but I'm not sure followers are, you know, Followers are not there. Yeah, it's not the same thing. Not the same thing. So, you know, I think he's, I think he, he's got his family, but I think he got, um, as many people do, he got um, even more uh, disconnected, which is not healthy. It's not what you want. Uh, I, I, I'm guessing because I'm looking at his life from a long ways away. Yeah. But I'm also looking at both looking at his life from all and, and looking at the symptoms. And um, so if you look at the Spire perspective, he's brilliant, uh, spiritually somewhat aware, but um, not swimming in the same spiritual water that other people we deal with are because just time and being broken is a good start, but it takes a good 20 years after that to have the fruit really grow in your life. So I, I'm hoping great things for him. And I imagine that those things will happen. But if you look at it from a Spire perspective, um, you know, he's, he's not necessarily uh, evenly grown. Yeah. yeah which I, I relate to. I, I was that same way. Maybe still. Yeah. I, I read a, a summary of, I forget which of Nietzsche's books it was. And I haven't read it, so I may have this entirely wrong. Um, but there was a, a scene, I, it might have been in Thus Spoke Zarathustra. I, I'm not sure. But there was a scene in which there was a, a tiny man, like 
a fifth of the size of a normal person with a giant ear. And he like, <laughs> and that, that signified that he was strong intellectually. Like he was, his spire, his intellectual was massive and everything else was disproportionately small, which is yeah. kind, of, kind of the model for Jordan Peterson's life. And a lot of and a lot of academics. Well, all of our lives, really, at some point, and I, we pick on him because he's he's famous and he's easy to look at, and he's and he is. I'll tell you one thing I really appreciate about him is he is authentic to himself. What you see is what you get. I think that's really the real guy. Like I I, I don't think he's faking any of that. So it makes it easier. And and I think some people might consider this ju this a judgmental conversation. I don't mean it to be. I mean it to be a friendly conversation. I think if Jordan were here, I'd have the same conversation and and share some of my same things because we have things in common, him and I. And sometimes what I find most irritating about him is an ex-smoker, you know? You know, it, it, when you quit smoking, you, smokers really irritate you, you know? And, mm -hmm. and so we're both Canadian. And so there's some things that uh, probably irritate me about him that remind me of myself. Yeah. Are you are you familiar with William Lane Craig at all? I've heard the name. I I, I can't uh, I can't put uh, can't put it together right now. He's a, but he's a theologian. He's been around for a long time. But he engages he engages in debates with a lot of prominent neo atheists like Dawkins and Harris, etc. And he's got he's got a lot of great stuff to say. And he engages in the intellectual realm first. But then I think he does a really good job of kind of switching it to the more spiritual and and drawing it back to love and God's message. So I think I think he's really he's pretty good. You should check him out. I like him. I'll check him out. But here, here's the question I have for me personally is at the end of the conversation, does the guy he's talking to feel more or less loved? I mean, That's I, I couldn't speak for the guy, but I assume they all they all end well. Like it never gets. That's good. They, they don't get if like it's working, them. if they feel more collegial at the end, if they feel more respect, if they don't, I don't care whether they ever agree. It doesn't really matter. But um, if we're doing it right as Christians, we're engaging intellectually, we're engaging relationally, we're engaging emotionally. But at the end, um, people realize that we have their best interests at heart. If that's happening um then it's a win but if we're winning at the expense of other people even if we win the argument we've still lost yeah and that's the big deal for me is and and i i fail at that regularly i'm sure i make people feel like crap after they're done talking to me you know i, I don't mean to do that but i i'm sure i do it all the time but it's something i'm working on it's something i um somebody said something to me last week and you know i realized i need to i need to I need to say that differently because I didn't, I, I just handled it differently. I just said to the person, she called me arrogant and I agreed with her. <laughs> I'm like, well, you got me on a technicality. Let me tell you how arrogant, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and I opened my life to her a little bit to say, here's where I'm at. And you're reading text, which may or may not reflect well, but if we were having a coffee, I think we'd probably enjoy each other's company a lot more. Yeah, I, I recently, I think it was today that I heard a quote about the relationship between intelligence, intelligence and arrogance. And I really liked that. I can't remember what it is, but I mean, I think it's, I think it's common. Like I, I see the same thing in myself that like, I, I think I know more than I do, or I just think I know nothing, which might be better if I think I know nothing, but. Well, they, I think it's good to be accurate. I think yeah. it's good to know. I think it's good to be. Um, I think it's good to be really aware of our own ignorance. Um, I've recently started engaging on the conversation that I sent you is um, using a Clubhouse, mm. and I'm getting on these conversations, and I feel like I, I've got something to say. And then I look at the resumes of the people who are talking, and I'm like, Oh, I'm gonna, I'm not saying a word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm not saying a word, man. And I'm going to shut up and listen, you know, uh, because I, I I become aware that uh, they forgot more before breakfast than I may ever know, you know. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, yeah I've, I've gone into some of those rooms and the hosts of the rooms are just like, they're, they're crazy, just PhDs and who knows what, but they're interesting yeah. conversations. I like them. They are. And, and one thing about it is um, I, I, I'm studying for my doctorate under a, a brilliant man, a guy who writes five or six books, Leonard Sweetie writes five or six books a week, uh, a year. And 
he's brilliant. And, um, but the more brilliant people are, the, the more integrated they are, the better you feel being around them. Leonard is brilliant, but he's w really good to be around. And he never makes you feel, I used to, I was teaching college a while back. I was teaching network engineering. I had spent a decade or more making 125 bucks an hour for every hour I could stay awake. And I stayed awake for a decade or more. And I, and I'm teaching these kids his very first introductory networking class where, you know, at the end I have them wire up an ethernet cable, like literally it's fundamental stuff. And they all want to be network engineers at the end and make 125 bucks an hour. And what I need to tell them is when you graduate from this college, you'll be ready to start learning. And about a decade from now, you might be able to do that if you work really hard. You'll be able to, you know, you graduate from this college, you'll be ready to start learning. What I learned as a teacher is it is counterproductive. Even if a person is a complete moron, it's counterproductive to tell them that. What you really want to do is provide them with enough stimulation that they realize it themselves. And then they're and they're open to open to learning. So you want two things to happen. One is for them to realize they don't know and to realize there's no shame in not knowing and that and that I'm really interested in giving them everything I possibly can. Once they realize that that's my orientation, not to beat them down, not to prove they don't know, not to have a arm wrestling of the brains. But I'm, I'm saying, I don't know everything. Trust me on this, you know, and there's new stuff happening as, as an IT guy for, uh, uh, you know, 15 years or so, my entire world reinvented itself every 18 months. You had to start over basically. Um, and, you know, you could bring some stuff forward, some, I could start today and that was 20 years ago, I could start today and I'd have a great leg up on people that were just starting. Um, it's funny, after all those many years and, you know, making a ton of money at that, I look at guys that are just graduating from computer school and I'm like, oh, I know where you have to go. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's a long road, <laughs> you know? And then I look at other people who, you know, I'm just finished my doctor, I'm almost 60 years old. You know, and uh, and then you got to be looking at me saying, oh, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> what are you thinking? You know, it's OK. We all have our different journeys. I'm on my third career. And and we start, I think, as you get older and smarter, you start to realize that um, everything that's of value happens in the struggle. It's not in. Yeah, we all want to. We all want to spend time in the mountaintops. So I'll tell you what: the mountaintops are cold and windy, and ain't no vegetables up there. There's mm -hmm. nothing to eat up there. In yeah, fact, there's nowhere good. to go to a bathroom. You know, yeah, there ain't nothing up there. You know, so it's wonderful. You can see as far as you can see, but you know, for everything that matters, from eating to going to the bathroom, you got to go down the valley. It's all down the valley. All the soils down there. All the vegetables are down there. All the life is down there. Yeah, that, so, that was like the purpose of the last video I recorded for this channel was like saying that the goal is probably not as good as you think it's going to be. And if it is, it's not going to last for that long. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, uh, interesting story. When I lived in Dallas, um, what is it? There was a guy, uh, uh, not Sanderson, um, he played in the NFL and the and the M, M Major League Baseball at the same time. Uh, Bo um, Jackson? No, he, maybe him too, but this guy's named San, not Sanderson. Uh, I'll think of his name. Anyway, he, um, after his second Super Bowl, he attempted suicide. Mm. He's the most talented, one of the most talented people you can imagine. And what happened is his whole life, he was focused on these goals, these big, hairy goals. And the worst thing that can happen to you is that you achieve all of your goals. What are you going to do now? He became despondent because there was nothing to live for. If you're living for these goals, you're living for something other than today. You're living always into the future. And if you ever catch it, it's like, you know, dog chasing a car. What, what happens if you catch it? <laughs> what are you going to do with it now? <laughs> okay, I got it, you know, but what am I going to do with it? Yeah. And uh, I think that's one of the things, you know, we, um, the, the part of, you know, if you think of the present's four seconds long 
and worrying is bringing a some future four seconds into this second to solve it and regret is bringing some previous six, four seconds into this there's only the present we only have four seconds to live and if you're bringing the past or the future into that you miss those four seconds and i wonder how many of our four second epochs in life we actually live i know for a long time i didn't live too many of them i was living in the future or in the past and it's an art form there's some meditation that you have to actually get there you can't just stay in the present because you decided to it becomes a habit to live outside of that and it becomes it, it becomes um it takes some effort to to find a way to be fully present spiritually physically intellectually relationally emotionally all at the same time yeah usually have, when you, when you do that is freaking no painful yeah i have absolutely no idea how to do that but i'm trying to i'm trying to learn so start with meditation so here's one thing my first my first um my first career in biomedical engineering i was a research engineer in anesthesia and our research was on the autonomic nervous system and i would have thought that um that was a wasted career because I went in completely different. And now I'm a pastor. Like, what, what, what does that? And literally, it all, it all relates. It all relates. Who knew? Um, when you meditate, um, it, what, what, um, neurologically, what, what fires together wires together. So, um, when we meditate and cause a, a, a lowered firing, um, we get, we, we grow the brain in areas that, that we would not normally grow without, without meditation, we would not be growing those areas of the brain. Just because we grow that area of the brain doesn't necessarily we use it. So meditation creates a physiological difference, but it doesn't necessarily teach us how to use that, that, that difference. So there's two parts. One is the physio. So people meditate six times and they're like, okay, it, it's not doing anything. I'm done. I'm not doing it anymore. It doesn't work. And so the re the, the way that meditation works best is that you meditate for 15 minutes a day for a year and you will have a different size brain at the result. There'll be measurable differences in your brain if you've done that for a year and and then you learn how to use that for peace. Right. And so there's two parts to it. The, um, we think of anxiety and depression as uh, mental disorders, which they are. But I think often they start out as a mental issue and become a physiological issue. Our, our brains wire that way. And so what we're one of my favorite authors right now is Bezel van der Kolk. He has a book called The Body Keeps a Score. And he's saying, we treated all these things as, as, as um, talk therapy issues. And they are to an extent, but they also, the body stores the trauma. It's not just our brains that store the trauma. And so he has, he's advocating ways that are natural that we can work through the trauma that, we've, that we're storing in our bodies. It's helpful. He's a, um, a physician at Harvard and brilliant guy. Yeah, that's really cool. I was, I'm interested and was interested in um, like breathing techniques for a long time because I, I like research shows it can have some of the same effects as meditation. And yes. I mean, it, it is of itself meditation because you're just yes. sitting there breathing for a long time. Yes. Um, but I read an awesome book on it called Breath. Um, and it's really cool. So you should. Yeah, I have that. I had that. I, I had that bad breath. Halitosis. It was same. No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's really cool. And I, I did that for a long time. I didn't like notice great effects, but it's probably because I didn't do it for a year. Like it's the, it's the thing with, um, uh, what's the, what's the quote? It's like the Mason doesn't break the rock on the first hit. He breaks it on the 300th hit, but it was every hit up until that hit that, that led yeah. to breaking. So. Yeah, the, another way of yeah, and the way I'm looking at that is is that um, uh, we have neuroplasticity where our brains yeah. rewire themselves based on what they need, and so what we're do there there's two processes. There's the process of altering our physiology to make peace possible, 
And once it's possible, then you have to have peace, which is another step. You know, people just, you know, meditate six times and when they haven't found nirvana, they quit, you know, instead of saying, okay, for a year, if I do this, I will create the potential, the physiological potential for peace. And then I have to find peace. Then I have to do, not necessarily sequentially like that. It can be simultaneous or overlapping, but they're not the same, necessarily the same process. The way we alter our physiology and the way we, um, we, the way we experience peace might be quite different. Yeah. Neuroplasticity is so interesting. I know um, Dr. Andrew Huberman of Stanford is like a big researcher into neuroplasticity and he hasn't written any books yet. I think he's coming out with one this year, but I've listened to like all of his stuff and it's, it's crazy stuff. And I mean, I've implemented some of the things and I've found it really helps. And it's such a, I mean, it's crazy what like you can wire your brain to do by just doing certain actions. Yes. Yes. And so one of the ways I look at neuroplasticity is you think about uh, if you have a, a beautiful lawn and you ride a bicycle across it, you can see the bicycle track, but it's not that big of a deal. But if you ride that bicycle track across it every day of the year, you'll create a rut. And then when you're riding on the lawn, you hit the rut, you're stuck in the rut, you know, and neuroplasticity is like the rut. It, um, if you think about uh, our brains as they're, um, and then we, we've got, we've got some significant problems with that right now. We've got addiction to screens. You know, we're getting uh, dopamine hits from our screens at levels that nature can't provide. And so we're, we're creating this repetitive. If you think about um, carpal tunnel syndrome, you know, it's repetitive injury to your wrists. Well, PTSD and, and some of those other other issues are like repetitive issues to the brain, trauma issues to the brain. Same as carpal tunnel is this repetitive thing that messes up the tendons in our wrist. The same thing happens in our brain. Our brain, you can't, you know, we think about what you got for your third birthday. You generally can't remember because you your brain hasn't thought about that in a long time and it repurposed those cells to do something else. And um, if you, if, if every year you remembered what you got on your third birthday, this year you'd remember because you'd refreshed it all those times. But if you don't refresh something regularly, it, it drifts away. Sometimes you'll see a photograph and it will do just enough to refresh it. And you go, oh yeah, I remember that, you know? Wow, look at that, I hadn't seen that in years. But there's a lot of repurposing that's gone on to make that a foggy memory until it's, until it's recalled somehow. And um, that's, uh, I believe, effect, effective neuroplasticity. Your, your brain is repurposing those resources for other things. And if it's uh, hyper um, vigilance, you know, that makes a big pipeline, you know, that's got a lot of hormonal, you know, stress hormones and things that are all orienting in the same way to create this, to recreate this known entity of hyper vigilance. And we only feel alive when we're hyper vigilant. So, you know, if you don't get it one way, we get it another. You know, we can't get it out of our lives. So we jump out of an airplane, you know, or whatever, <laughs> start doing yeah. these risky behaviors that produce the same high because yeah. we become addicted to it. And the way back from that, that ratchets up, right? It ratchets up and the way back it's rat, rat, that's a, uh, that's a vendor called you saying ratchet the other way. You can use the ratchet in the, the other direction and by meditation forms of meditation, also biofeedback, which uh, there's not a lot of studies on it right now. It's a little bit like snake oil at this point. But I believe um, that once the studies start, once they've done, um, right now, when I was a, when I was a biomedical engineer, uh, uh, an EEG machine was 130 grand, and and he, and it took a, t a trained technician an hour to get the electrodes on your head, and now you can buy uh, a, a wireless EEG machine, 24 channels, size of your palm of your hand. And they have a helmet for dry contacts that you can print out on a, on a 3D printer. And you put the two things together, you put it on your head and it's hooked, you know? <laughs> what used to cost 130 grand in an hour every time happens in seconds and it's wireless. You can walk around and it's still connected. And they can do also multimodal studies so that you can do not only EEG, but these other things. So what's possible biomedically is freaking amazing. You know, it's 650 less than a thousand dollars for an EEG machine. You can replicate the things. So biofeedback is based on filtering for certain EEG um, 
uh, nodes and frequencies. And the way they do it is they filter for those frequencies and they hook the frequency up to a ship or some object on the screen. And they teach you to move the object using your brain. So you figure out how to create the wavelength that produces the, the growth that, that the brain needs. And, uh, and they tell, and they, they're able to dial it in based on this thing moving on the screen when you get it right. So the first few times the things moved, it was accidental. And you keep, you know, thinking and, and figuring out how to do it. And what do you know, next thing you know, I think it's like uh, looking at those magical uh, pictures, you know, you got to look through the picture to see this three dimensional thing. Well, you got to learn how to do that. And I think biofeedback is similar to that. Yeah, it's like it's like it. using the force, like using your yeah, force yeah. Stuff. Except except there's no, except it's the the program is moving it. It's moving it in response to a specific brain wave yeah. wavelength and frequency that you're making. So you have a, a bandpass filter that they're looking for a very specific um, action in your brain, and when that occurs, the program moves it. So. It is like that, but it's actually inverted to that. Your yeah. brain is not actually moving it. It's not magical. Uh, the program is indicating to you that you're getting the right frequency by the movement. Hmm. Um, and they're able to do that now with just a couple of contacts. They can put a headband, basically. You can do some of it with just a headband. But that, in the next while, is going to help people with PTSD heal, you know, uh, because we think of PTSD as broken, broken minds broken thought processes and to some extent that's true but it's also uh broken physiology yeah that i think neuroscience is like taking leaps and bounds in Ooh. like the stuff it's learning it's crazy and, I, and so you got you got a, a meet emerging of Brene brown doing you know doing her gig and Vendor, Bessel van der Kolk, they're overlapping now. They're, it's all merging together. It's becoming, uh, what's going to happen in the next little while is going to be uh, unbelievable. And, and, and now we're thinking like within the next few years, interfaces are going to go away. We're going to have, we already have the capacity to have uh, it, it, transducers connected directly from our brain to machines. And um, so we're eventually not going to have displays anymore. You know, we'll be able to think what we want to have. They, they've already got some of that happening now, but that's only going to grow. We're going to have implants. We're going to have implants. When when I was a kid, they didn't have my, my a mouse didn't come around. A computer mouse didn't come around until the until the eighties, the late seventies. They were they existed, but not everywhere. Early eighties, they were the very first ones you really saw. And people, when they first did, they'd be looking at the hand and they'd be doing this. Like, you know, it's funny to watch. It's like watching an 80 year old person today who's never seen a mouse trying to use it. They're looking at it, you know, and a four year old walks up and he's, you know, it just works because they, they've never experienced the world without a mouse or without a trackpad. It's just never occurred. And when we get these transducers, they will be implanted early enough that kids will never really experience a life without them. And what's going to be possible for the good and for the bad when that happens is beyond our imagination yeah yeah beyond. Like all the all the stuff elon is doing with like uh neural link i think that's what it's called yeah um, yeah that's crazy stuff and it, it's gonna have the power to do like all sorts of awesome things but i i don't really want to know what bad things will come out of it because they'll probably be equally as bad um, well it's it's the same if you think about your cell phone uh nobody saw the game theory coming out of that, that, that uh, the dopamine hits. And, you know, when I was a kid, pornography was Playboy magazines in the back of a, in the back of the, of the, of the corner store. And there's a, a finite amount of illicit porn that, that we, we do to your head, but you'd put that on the internet times thousands that you couldn't, I mean, you couldn't even carry a book home that big, you know, and, <laughs> and, and it just, you know, uh, the, 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 it becomes endless. And, and what, what porn is doing is short circuiting a natural process. This natural process is made to bond humans together and create this beautiful thing, um, create marriage that can't exist outside of that. And, and we're using it, you know, 
that's supposed to that's supposed to pop you know i don't know four or five times a day maybe and it's and they're hitting it 60 70 times an hour you know your 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 brain your brain and your body were never meant for that to happen and it starts addictions that's so addictions you know the the signs of addiction there's two signs of addiction that i know of one is that it is it, it, the the um the action becomes um, neurotic. It becomes uh, what, what, what's the compulsive? Impulsive, or? compulsive. Yeah, it becomes compulsive. And then the second sign is that it becomes it it it, it, it is, requires an increasing dose. It requires more mm -hmm. to do the same. And and that you know porn works that way. And so when you look at what porn has done to human beings, which is not good. Um, is made us more isolated, more objectified, uh, damaged us spiritually. You know, it's done a bunch of bad things to us. Um, you take that, and and now we can actually virtually create a sense that we've actually experienced a sexual event with it never having happened. How addictive would that be? <laughs> yeah, it's beyond you know. But on that same side, that's a negative. And we can abuse ourselves, but on the same side, um, we can probably produce methods of mediating pain for people that would have lived in pain their entire lives to actually experience something. We can probably make people that are um, quadriplegics can uh, can uh, become mobile with exoskeletons and and thought processes. Yeah. You know, there's these all these almost magical ideas that are going to happen, and it's the same freaking thing happening again. Everything that happens. Every, you know, they invented the wheel and good things happen and bad things happen. Yeah. Yeah. It was all great until it ran over your kid, you know, and, and, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. and uh, so it's, you know, again, I don't worry about the future and about the complexity of the future and about these huge inventions that are occurring. What I know is that if the spirit of God is living in me, and I don't have to worry about how to do that, what's good or what's bad. I can live out that and not be afraid of it. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not afraid of porn. Uh, it's not going to damage me. I can be around it and it's not going to damage me because, because I have tools to keep myself from objectifying myself and the people in the picture. So it's, it's not that attractive to me. And you know, it, it, it doesn't mean I'm not a, a red-blooded American man. It means that I've redirected my sexual uh, energy a different way. Yeah. It's one thing that Rob Bell said in um, Sex God. He said, you know, nuns, we think of nuns as these asexual beings. These are the very, very sexual human beings. They've just redirected their sexuality to a specific, to a specific uh, use. Mm. And uh, sexuality that has no outlet um, if you repress it, you produce the kind of abuse that you've seen of people abusing other people. They try to repress as long as they can, and, they, and then they abuse somebody. But uh, if you redirect it, then there, then it's not stopped up. You know, repression is never a good thing. And I think when religion creates re sexual repression, you end up with bad things. But if you, but if you see that desire, sexual desire, whatever is God given and good. And it always has a use, even if um, you're not in a position where having sex with another human being is the right thing to do right now for you. Um, it always has a use, so people can redirect it into artistic, you know, rather than repressing it, you can redirect it into artistic endeavor and do all of these other things that, um, that are beautiful. Yeah. I mean, I don't have any more questions. That was awesome. I, I actually have, you know, I never run out of stuff to say. I got a big yeah. mouth. So yeah, that's so, what my, that's what my dad said. He was like, "Give Vern whatever time period you want, and he'll talk for the entire time." And then just cut the power off <laughs> <laughs> while you yeah. while you still can cut it off. Yeah, yeah. I I used to not be able to do that at all. Like I I can only talk for like thirty seconds max. But as I'm like reading more and more and like recording these videos, I find myself just talking for like a half an hour straight. And yeah. And, and when you're talking, you're learning too. 
yeah. you know, it's not, uh, you're engaging. So it's not just talking, it's engaging. Right. And um, often when I'm talking, I have an internal dialogue saying, remember that's you too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I call somebody Jack one and I'm like, yes, remember that's you too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You point one finger and four point back, you know. <laughs> Yeah, that's why that's like what you said. That's why I want to be a professor because I've found that I learn the most by talking about what I think I know. And then that's oh, yeah. what I actually know. Oh, you got to look at the learning pyramid. Um, that, that's exactly what the learning pyramid says. The pyramid of learning at the very top is lecture. It's almost, it almost produces no knowledge transfer, and it's what we do. Uh, so, very top, of, and then and then below that is more practical demonstration, participation, the very, the most effective way of learning something is having to teach it. So the very, the most effective way is having to teach it because you have to teach it. You have to take everything you think you know, and all of a sudden you're in the middle of, and you're like, oh, I'm not sure I know that. I better go look that up. Yeah. You know, so teaching it, teaching it is definitely a very, very effective way of learning. And um, yeah, look at the learning pyramid. It's very helpful. In, uh, and so what do you think? You think about churches, uh, a guy, one, I read a book by a guy once, he said form creates function. So he goes, you go in a church and it has rows of pews that are bolted to the floor facing a raised pl uh, a pulpit that's a high and above everything else. The only thing you can do there is lecture, right? Some guy's going to go up in the pulpit. You're all going to sit there and listen to him. That's the, the room is designed and so that's all that's ever going to happen. So in effect, We've designed the building to make sure that learning happens in the least effective way possible. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, we should probably work that out. I'm thinking. Yeah, I'm thinking. Well, what right. you and I, I are doing. Know, I don't know how else you'd like structure it though, because well, for, for some we're doing reason. church right now. This is it. Yeah, this yeah. is it. We, neither one of us think we know everything at all. The more we talk, the less we know. Yep. You know, we, we start realizing every time we have a conversation, usually we're taking notes of what we got to go look up now because it's interesting. We should go read that now. Your, your reading list, you're going to you, literally, if you die a young man, it's because your pile of books fell on you is what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly how <laughs> Your it's pile going. of unread books are going to fall on you. God help you, that happens. You won't be able to breathe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you better get some. You better make sure Kindle. You know, your your, mm. your Kindle's going to get so heavy, you won't be able to pick it up. <laughs> you have books in there. Yeah, yeah. I found that like, I, I've done probably. I think this is like the eighth video, but after each video I record, I like I I usually edit it that night or like the next night, and I so I listen to the whole thing again and can like think about what I said, what what the other person said. And that's like, that's actually where I learned like the most is hearing it again the second time. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm, dis I'm disconnected from it. I'm not yeah. like trying to think of the next thing to say or anything like that. Sure. Um, but I found that like, I just get this like feeling while like after it's done that I like, I don't, it's just a weird feeling. Like I, I don't know, but I think it's because that I like realize through talking, even though, even if I think I'm talking about something I know a lot about. I'm realizing that I really like don't understand as much as I think I do. And like that, that gives me the thing, the, the motivation I need to learn more about it and not just like stay in the thoughts that I have, but continue to learn. Yeah. About. Well, and, and, the, and the thing about it is don't ever get down on yourself about that. It's, it is to, to realize. So I used to build, I used to build a triangle for my students when I would start and there's, there's pieces. So the first piece is what, you know, and the next piece is, what you know you don't know. And then the rest of the circle, most of the circle is what you don't know you don't know. It's ignorance, you have no idea, you don't even know you don't know it. And then there's one other slice that I like to say, the other is what you know, but you don't wanna know. That's that's denial. Mm. Denial is not just a river in Egypt. Yeah. It's, a, it's <laughs> denial is what you know you don't wanna know. And so the idea in my classes, I would say, if you learn, if we make what you know, just a slice, it's a tad bigger, it's a huge win. But if we can double the size of what you know you don't know, that's a bigger win. Because if you know you don't know something, in one night you can look it up in Google and you can find out 20% of what you got to know right from Google. And if you put a little more effort in, you can get to the 50th percentile within a few weeks of any topic if you know you don't know it. 
And you can actually almost be an expert on it in a couple of years if you put a little effort in, you know, so knowing you don't know something is a huge benefit. And so what I told them, what I tell my students is if, if in this class, you can learn to formulate a question so that you can figure out what you don't know, you don't know, you can quit college, you're done. The whole idea of college is being able to figure out what you don't know, you don't know, and make it what, what you don't know. So you move, you always move what you don't know, you don't know into what you don't know. And from what you don't know, you move it into what you do know. Yeah. It's like a funnel coming in. And so uh, increasing the size of what you don't know, you don't know, or what, increasing the size of what you don't know is a very valuable thing. Yeah. yeah. And that's what you're doing. Like every time you have a conversation, you're like, oh, didn't know that. <laughs> you know, yep. That didn't even know that like, category existed. They got yep. a word for that. Yeah, it's pretty crazy, but it's also helpful. Like I forget, oh, yeah. who, I, I forget who said it, one philosopher, he was like, the more I read and learn, the more I know that I don't know anything or something like yeah. that. Yeah, absolutely. It's a wonderful thing. It's called education. Education um, does a couple of things. Also, education helps you. Um, you know, part of what I have to do is I have to read people's stuff. And then I have to say, well, what, why should I believe they know anything about that? Like, is there, is there any reason to believe they know anything about that? They have an education or a background that says they, they know that. And if they don't, I discount the whole thing by how much, you know, like, like, you know, some guy really doesn't know anything about it. It's his first book and he did, and he spent his time doing one thing, he does another. Then what he says in there becomes less valuable to me. And, um, and then you have to look at, okay, who's he aligned with and what's he trying to accomplish? Is he getting paid? Like, you know, uh, if he's a QAnon guy and he's getting paid to propagate this stuff, then he's got an incentive He's got a disincentive to tell the truth, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, whatever he said. Literally, I'm, I'm I'm done reading at this point. Like, I'm I'm, I'm not going to read anymore because, because I, I'm I'm going to get further and further away from reality. Um, so part of, you know, one thing that you and I talked about would be good to use uh, EndNote as a software um, that you can keep track of what you're reading and and make a, a life bibliography, but then you can make a, a, a functional big bibliography. You put PDFs of what you're reading in there if it's small enough, and if it's an article or whatever, and then you can also do a small paragraph to do an annotated bibliography of what did you think when you read it? Like what's in it for you? And you can search all that later. It makes it yeah. finding things a lot easier. Because what you're gonna realize really quickly is you're gonna know some, you read it somewhere, and God help you, you're never gonna find it. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's this gargantuan thing behind you and you're like, oh, it's somewhere in there. Yeah, I actually I actually noticed that recently. I was writing a paper in an English class and I thought of a quote in a book that I know would apply to the paper. Yeah, and I couldn't for <laughs> the life of me find where the quote was, but I knew it came from the book. I eventually so, found it by searching the PDF for it. But yeah, I usually um, what I've been doing, if I take the time, uh, if I own a book, I, I will often, and it doesn't exist on Kindle, I will often scan it and OCR it for that reason. Uh, you know, if I own it. Um, but I also, tr I also try, to, try to buy the Kindle because I, the searchability and being able to also, if you highlight it, the highlighting uh, propagates across your devices. And for me, that's a really big deal because it's, I'm doing the same thing you are. Like, I won't even remember who the author was. I'll be like, oh, I read something on that it was so good. Uh, and it just really articulates. One other thing I would recommend you do, um, a friend of mine, I had a weird thing. I was, I, I was just as you were calling, I was at a funeral uh, over in um, the center of the country. But yesterday, a friend of mine uh, passed away in Australia and I went to his funeral via Zoom. And, I'm you sorry. know, I hadn't talked, I, I've known this guy for 20 years. And I've never met him, but I've known him for 20 years. I know him very well through with this online community we were part of for 20 years. But that, that vaporized about 10 years. I hadn't talked to the guy in almost 10 years. He called me a year ago for the first time in 10 years. And then he called me last week, just out of the blue, talking about the weather, which I wasn't that interested in. But this guy calls me and I have this conversation. A year ago, he sent me this poetry from this really cool author and then a week later, I get a call from his wife. He goes, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you this, but David died. I'm like, the, the heck? He called me. I, I didn't hear from him. Then he calls me, then he's dead. Said, Maybe he shouldn't have called me. <laughs> but, 
be careful for the next week. We've been on this call for a bit. <laughs> um, but the, the author that he is a poet, he's this Irish poet. And uh, because he was my friend, he passed away. I, I paid more attention I than I, I should have paid attention in the first place. This guy's brilliant. And he also is reading poetry from these other brilliant Irish poets. And uh, don't forget to read poetry. You know, don't forget to, uh, to not only smather your brain with, with knowledge, but also with beauty. Uh, this poet, uh, un unbelievable poetry. And the thing about poetry is they just, they, you know how you snap a towel? When you snap a towel, the reason it snaps is the end is going faster than the speed of sound. That's why it snaps. And a poet will snap your brain that way. <laughs> you know, it just, you're going along and suddenly you're going the other direction. It's like, whoa, how do you do that? That's weird. Yeah. Poetry is powerful. And I, I, I discounted poetry until this, until a class that I just had last semester that we read poetry all the time. And now I like, I appreciate the beauty and the, the profundity that poetry can offer. And Here's be a really interesting thing for your podcasts. Uh, what if you, at the end of your podcast, uh, wrote everything that happened in a poem at the end? <laughs> Except I'm not that good at writing poems. Well, that's because you don't write poems. True. I could I could get better at it, I suppose. Yeah. But the best thing about poems is they snap your brain. And you're dealing with some pretty interesting stuff. Uh, if you read, it doesn't have to be about what it's about. It can be an allegory to what it's about. This guy, this guy's name is David White, W-H-Y-T-E. And what he read, they read at this, my friend's funeral, he said, there's a, there's a road always beckoning. There's a road always beckoning. When you see the two sides of it closing together at that far horizon, and deep in the foundations of your heart at exactly the same time, that's how you know where you have to go. That's how you know it's the road you have to follow. That's how you know... Uh, that's how you know you have to go. That's how you know it's just beyond yourself. It's where you need to be. So the guy's brilliant, you know. That's really good. It really is simple. It's it's yeah. simple, but um, there's a tension between that and the conversation you and I just had. But the his poem is about our conversation, the whole thing. So maybe don't write the poem. Find the poem. Yeah, you know that that's a perfect poem for this conversation, because but what we're saying is, what we're looking for isn't here. Yeah, it's out. It's it's just out there a bit, and we'll get enough of it. But we're never going to get it, thank God, because we'd be bored if we ever caught it. It's like a, you know, the, reading that poem. The opposite, the same as reading that poem is, you know, a dog chasing a car and actually catching it. Yeah, what do you do? You know, that would not be good. No, not. See, it's crunchy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh well, this was good. We're we're over two hours already. This is oh, awesome. you got you got off easy. <laughs> <laughs> ask ask your dad. It's not midnight. Holy, <laughs> you escaped. I escaped with my life. Yeah, yeah. lucky you. Some, some shred of knowledge. Yeah, uh, most people have to play dead for forty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just turn their turn their zoom camera off and just lag out that's it thanks well, for this this is awesome yeah this i was just gonna say that to you thank you for coming on and enlightening me and everybody who will listen to this the tens of millions of people who listen to this we we may have cured insomnia it's perfect <laughs> yeah <laughs> we'll just put it up and yeah just lights out instantly lights out that's it. Just don't listen to it while you're driving. <laughs> yeah, that would not be good. It no, might, might no. cause more harm than good. No. All well, right, my brother. It's great to you. talk. Yep. You bet. We'll see you. Bye.